Well, we are in hour three of Learn the Bible in 24 Hours, in which we'll undertake to review chapters 4 through 11 of Genesis. The first 11 chapters of Genesis are viewed by most people as prehistory. This is uh, the first unit of a two-unit review of Genesis. From chapter 12 on, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph are the patriarchs. But we are in hour three in which we're going to talk about chapters 4 through 11. And uh, so as we look at the panorama of history, where we've been through the creation and the fall of man, and now we're undertaking the story of Cain and Abel. We'll talk a little bit about Noah, the flood of Noah, of course, but what will surprise many is we'll talk a little bit about the days of Noah. Most people have little insight as to why the flood really came and what that's all about. And then we'll conclude this session with a quick look at the Tower of Babel and what's called the Table of Nations. So that's our challenge for this session, hour three. Genesis chapter four is the famous story of Cain and Abel, the two brothers. And uh, they both had offerings. Cain was a farmer, Abel a shepherd, and they both gave offerings. The significance of the offerings is often misunderstood. Cain, of course, being a farmer, gave as an offering of the fruit of the ground. Abel gave a lamb, but not just because he was a shepherd. One of the insights that most people miss, and you wouldn't get this unless you've read the rest of your Bible and come back to this, is the lamb was the designated offering to be given. And uh, Cain may have meant well, but he wasn't following the directions. So Abel's offering was accepted and Cain's was not. Now the first question that should occur to us is how would they know? When you put an offering in the offering plate in church, <laughs> you can be pretty sure it'll be accepted, but in any case, you would have no knowledge if they didn't. But in these days, apparently, there is some scriptural indication that the offering was consumed by fire from heaven. That may sound strange to us because that's not our normal practice, but it was clear that both Cain and Abel recognized the acceptance or non-acceptability of their offering, and that was what gave rise to Cain's envy or hatred of Abel. And uh, so Cain's offering was the fruit of his own labors, Abel's the lamb. And Cain's offering was rejected, and that's what caused him to, or should say motivated him at least, to murder his brother Abel, rather extreme. So we have the second murder. Many people call it the first murder, and in a sense it is, but the real, the, really the first murder was when Satan deceived Adam and Eve, and in effect uh, they lost their immortality. They were mortal. They were, they, they were uh, consigned to death, ultimately. So let's take a look at this, though. Both Cain and Abel came from the same parents, okay? Fallen parents. Both of them were outside of Eden. This did not occur in Eden. So they were judicially alienated. And I'm going to suggest that we're all in that same boat. And uh, they had a differing basis, though, because Cain's offering was of his own works, the fruit of a cursed ground. But uh, in contrast to Abel's offering, which anticipates representatively the offering of Jesus Christ. And it's only the offerings that are acceptable to God that are going to be acceptable. And he's been very, he has been very specific on his specifications. It's interesting to realize that death was required. See, it was the substitutionary death of the Lamb that pointed to the fact that there will be a substitutionary death on our behalf to be given and that was just emblematic of that which occurred, of course, on the cross uh, 2,000 years ago. And God would provide, uh, and we'll see that very dramatically dramatized when we get to Genesis 22 in very clear terms. And it's when you've read not just through Genesis but the rest of the Bible and come back and reread Genesis, you begin to realize how this fits into the picture. Reading the story on its own may leave you hanging there. But another question I'd like to deal with as we get into this, these early chapters, that story of Cain and Abel, I think all of us know. I know everybody likes to, whenever we go around, they always ask, who, where did Cain get his wife? Well, he married his brother's sister because he was Abel. So I'll just leave that with you to resolve that. And I'm, uh, we, we should realize that uh, Adam and Eve had many sons and daughters. The scripture indicates that. And obviously there's a, there's a non-trivial population at the time. Because remember, the combination of the many uh, boys and girls that were born in the family uh, and recognize that the years go by, these are extreme longevities, there's quite a population, so much so that Cain was in fear 
of being attacked. That's why God gives them special protection. But there's another issue. As we get to Genesis chapter 5, it's a strange chapter. Uh, the first three, four chapters are exciting. You've got the creation, you've got the story of Adam and uh, Eve, and then Cain and Abel. When you get to Genesis 6 on, you have the flood of Noah and all that action. But Genesis chapter 5 is one of these strange chapters you tend to sort of skip over. It's just a genealogy, a family tree. Why bother? I mean, is it what, why there? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that one of the exciting discoveries that you need to make for yourself is to discover the hidden messages. They're all through the Bible. I don't mean just the Bible codes that create some controversy, but messages, both in terms of what the lessons are from the uh, narratives, but also there are some other hidden messages. And the Scripture says that there are. In Proverbs 25, 2, it says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, and it's the honor or duty of kings to search out a matter. Well, let me start this with a riddle. Who is the oldest man in the Bible? Anyone? Methuselah. Methuselah lived 969 years. Yet he died before his father. Whoops. <laughs> How can that be? He's the oldest man in the Bible, yet he died before his father. That little riddle you can spring on your neighborhood Bible study this week. Because everyone forgets who his father was. His father was Enoch, who didn't die. And uh, so and Enoch's a very interesting guy. When he was 65 years old, something happened in his life that caused him from that day on to walk with God. In fact, he did for 300 years following. And among the things that happened there is that... Uh, he had a son by the name of Methuselah. Now you should understand that the flood of Noah did not come as a surprise. It had been preached on for four generations. In fact, uh, what God told uh, Enoch was that when his son was born, the judgment of the flood that was coming would be withheld for as long as he lived. As long as he's alive, the judgment of the flood would be withheld. So he named his son Methuselah. It comes from two Hebrew roots. The word muth, which means his death. It occurs 125 times in the Old Testament. And the verb shalak, which means to bring or send forth. The name Methuselah, made up of those two roots, is his death shall bring. Strange name, but it's a prophecy because he, his father knew that as long as his son's alive, this judgment that was uh, coming would be withheld. And indeed, if you look at the genealogies that are presented in Genesis chapter 5. Methuselah was 187 when his son Lamech was born, and Lamech was 182 when his son Noah was born. And it's the 600th year of uh, Noah's life that the flood came. And if, so if you take the 187 and the 782, you get the 969 years that Methuselah is alive. Methuselah's life becomes a symbol of God's mercy. And it's interesting that it is thus the longest lifetime in the Bible deliberately because of God's, as an expression of God's mercy. Not infinite. There comes a point at which it's cut off. But it is, uh, what shall I say, extravagant. But there is this genealogy in Genesis chapter 5. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Well, if there's all this insight behind the name of Methuselah, what about these other nine people? See, our problem in Genesis chapter 5, it's not translated for you. The rest of the uh, Bible, of course, is translated from its Greek or its Hebrew uh, into English. But we don't translate pro normally proper names. And uh, my name, my legal name is Charles. What does it mean? Who knows? There's all kinds of conjectures, but it's been lost in antiquity. And, uh, but in Hebrew, the names are, all Hebrew words are made from, up from a three-letter root. And if you know what the root means, you can infer the, the meaning of the word. And uh, the problem here is we don't translate the proper names. Even if you go to a, a Strong's Concordance or something of that nature, you'll find that it doesn't deal with proper names. And uh, so what, what they do here is they transliterate these names. They approximate the way it's pronounced in the English. Let's take a look. Let's take a quick look at the Hebrew that lies behind these names. The first name is Adam. It comes from Adama, which means man, and that's pretty straightforward. Adam and Eve have a son named Seth. After Cain, and after Cain kills Abel, Eve has, another, has a son by the name of Seth. The word Seth means appointed. And uh, you can 
uh, infer this from the Hebrew root dictionary, something of that nature. But uh, also Eve explains it to you at the end of chapter 4. In chapter 4, verse 25, when, when Seth is born, Eve said, For God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And when you look at a Hebrew Bible and look at the word appointed, you'll find it's essentially the equivalent word of Seth. Appointed me another that, that became slew. Okay. He has a son by the name of Enosh. Now, this comes from a root which means mortal, frail, or miserable. And uh, it's a root, the root is anash, which is an incurable thing, usually used of a wound or sometimes of grief, sickness, that sort of thing. And so uh, that's kind of a rough handle to go through school with, you know. Hey, miserable, you're on our team, you know. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't quite work. But uh, he names his son Kenan. Some of your Bibles say Canaan. That's a, a, a misunderstanding. Uh, Kenan can mean sorrow, dirge, or elegy, like a, a funeral. And uh, now he was tired, I think, of his name and his father's name. So when he has a son, he gives him a mouthful but a fabulous name, Mahalalel. Mahalalel. Mahal, which means blessed or praised one. And El, the name of God. Mahalalel means the, pra the praised God or the blessed God. That's pretty slick. Mahalalel has a son by the name of Yared, and it comes from the verb Yarad, which means shall come down. That's very straightforward, and there's more behind that, but I'll leave it for now. Um, his son is Enoch. Now, we've mentioned Enoch because the, as the father of Methuselah. He's an interesting guy for many reasons, but what does his name actually mean? It turns out it's an academic term. It means commencement or teaching. And so it's interesting that the oldest prophecy in the Bible uttered by a prophet, is a prophecy of the second coming of Jesus Christ, and it was uttered before the flood of Noah by Enoch. You won't find it here in Genesis. You'll find it in the book of Jude, the second to the last book of the Bible. And Enoch also, seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, Jesus Christ. So it's interesting that before the flood of Noah there are prophecies of uh, the second coming. Now, we know a lot of, from this prophecy in Jude. We know that the Lord's coming is certain, it's sure. We know who will come with him. We know the purpose of his coming. And we know the result of his coming, all from this little uh, prophecy of, of um, Enoch. Enoch. Now, the uh, Enoch was translated, that is raptured, if I can use that term, and he was apparently roughly midway between Adam and Abraham. We're going to discover another guy by the name of Elijah will be translated midway between Abraham and Christ. These are pers the, uh, persons that we'll deal with when we get there. Okay. Now, in Hebrews 11.5, there's an allusion to Enoch being translated. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So Enoch's quite a, Enoch's quite a guy. And he walked with God. That was not a casual stroll. It lasted 300 years. And uh, he was in agreement with, he was surrendered to, he was a witness of God. And that privilege that he had is available to us today. Colossians, Galatians, and 2 Corinthians will point the way for this, for all of us, in, in, in our own way to do that. But let's get back to his son Methuselah. I mentioned that his root means his death shall bring, and uh, the year the flood came is the year Methuselah died. Okay, well then we have Lamech, his son. And uh, here's a root uh, in the Hebrew that we have even in our English today. The, the, uh, it, it's evident in our English word lament or lamentation. And it, what does the Hebrew root really suggests despairing or its equivalent. And Lamech has a son by the name of Noah, which of course we've heard of. But what does his word mean? It comes from Nacham, which means to bring relief or comfort. Okay, comfort or rest. Now, let's take a look at this genealogy again. We have Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. So far so good. Let's read this genealogy, this family tree, in English. Okay, man is appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death, whose death? God's death. His death shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. Yeah, every time, every time I do this, I get goosebumps. 
Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, teaching that his death, God's death, shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. Here is a summary, a one-sentence summary of the Christian gospel tucked away in a genealogy in the Torah, in the book of Genesis, in the, in, 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 specifically in the book of Genesis. It has several implications. First of all, it demonstrates that God's plan of redemption was not a knee-jerk reaction to Adam's sin. He knew before Adam was uh, created that he would, if given the chance, he would get himself in a predicament that nothing less than the death of God himself would avail to, re- to uh, extricate him from that predicament. So it's a summary in that sense. But on the other, there's another aspect of this, even more practical in an in in apologetic sense. There's no way that you will ever convince me that a group of Jewish rabbis contrived to hide a summary of the Christian gospel in a genealogy in the Torah? No way. No, this is a fingerprint of the Holy Spirit. So we have one integrated design here. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. Here's an example. And the Old Testament, of course, is in the New Testament revealed. So again, I want to underscore the basic pillars of our ministry, the thing that, that our, the focus that makes us somewhat distinctive is based on two discoveries. The first discovery is that these 66 books that we have in our laps, called the Bible, even though they were penned by over 40 different guys over thousands of years, they are an integrated message system. Every detail of those 66 books is there by design, a design that could not be anticipated by the penmen over those thousands of years, but it all fits together. It's just like you've You've built, uh, you find a bunch of pieces and you put them together and find that they're a perfectly meshed jigsaw puzzle with no pieces missing and no pieces left over. You begin to realize that was designed. It wasn't by accident. Now, if you go that far in your understanding, you need, and again, you need to discover that for yourself. But once you discover that for yourself, there's another insight that emerges, and that is that the origin of that message system had to come from outside the dimensionality of time. And once you discover that, it alters your entire approach and understanding of the Bible. You'll have an awe or a reverence that comes no other way. Now let's get back to the, the uh, text that we're getting into, but a little bit of background. You know, Jesus made a strange remark when four disciples came to him for a confidential briefing on his second coming. He includes a strange remark. He says, as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, most of us don't really understand what he meant because we don't know what the days of Noah were like. We know all about Noah's flood, but we may not have studied the reasons the flood came. What problem was it solving? Well, the world was very sinful. If that's the case, we better get some life jackets. No, there's something deeper, I believe. In Genesis chapter 6, it opens up with a strange passage. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and took them wives of all which they chose. Now the first point I'd like you to notice, because most people miss this, is those two verses, Genesis 6 verses 1 and 2, are a single sentence. And that, that will aid us from making some mistakes here. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. It's men in general and daughters in general that the sons of God, and we'll come back to that term, it's a very special term, saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives of all wh- which they chose. This term, sons of God, is, the, is benai ha Elohim, sons of, of a God. This term is used in the Old Testament of angels. Every place it appears, it's of angels. In the Old Testament, it appears in Job, uh, three different places, Job 1, 6, 2, 1, and 38, 7. And uh, in the New Testament, you get the equivalent thing in Luke chapter, uh, chapter 20, verse 36. There is a Hebrew uh, book. It's not part of the Bible. I'm not going to suggest that it's inspired, but it's a valuable book for grammar and vocabulary. It emerged about two centuries before Christ, was very popular for several many centuries, called the Book of Enoch. It wasn't really Enoch. It was compiled by some rabbis, but it does demonstrate the belief that they had in those days, and it also helps us with the vocabulary and the grammar, and it uses this term the same way, of angels in great depth. But perhaps even more authentically, 
the Septuagint translation, three centuries before the ministry of Jesus Christ, the Hebrew Scriptures were translated into Greek. The Greek is a very, very precise language. The best scholars they could find came from Jerusalem to Alexandria to do this work. It took 15 years for them to, to uh, make the translation. And the Greek is very specific, and it does uh, uh, illuminate this passage in the direction we're talking about. We also find in this passage the daughters of men, Benoth Adam. These are daughters of Adam. I want to emphasize that because some people try to make this something else. That's, it's the daughters of Adam. And uh, so this is the same term as in, in the earlier part of the sentence in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. When you get down to verse 4 of chapter 6 of Genesis, it says, There were Nephilim in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. So this word Nephilim is another word that's important to understand. It's a very uh, uh, distinctive word. It, it means the fallen ones. It comes from the verb nephal, which is to fall away, to be cast down away, to fall away, to desert, if you will. The Nephilim are the fallen ones. These give rise to the Hagibarim, the mighty ones. And we'll, we'll hear more about them as we get through the Scripture. Now the Septuagint, that is the Greek translation of this, the word Nephilim was translated gigantes, and, uh, which is rendered in your English Bible as giants. Now, they did happen to be giants. That's another issue. But the word gigantes doesn't really mean giants. It comes from gigas, which means earthborn. So in the Greek, they're the earthborn. In the Hebrew, they're the fallen ones. These are hybrids. These are something unique and strange. Furthermore, when you get to verse 9 of Genesis 6, it speaks of Noah's family tree. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Same phrase we used with Enoch, interestingly enough. But he was perfect in his generations. This word in the Hebrew is tamim, which means without blemish, sound, healthful, without spot, unimpaired. It's a term used of physical defects. What this says in the Hebrew is that Noah's genealogy was not tainted, was not blemished, by the goings-on. And, uh, and uh, so what we're suggesting here is that a fallen angels came down to the earth and contrived some way to generate hybrids. And um, I believe that this was Satan's strategy to try to corrupt the human uh, line to try to avert any possibility of a redeemer. And uh, we'll talk more about that as it goes. It, so this is what's called the angel view of Genesis 6. And we'll get into this more, but if this is valid, we would expect, this is a very strange idea, I grant you, but if this is valid, we would find it confirmed in the New Testament. It, it, things are always confirmed by two or three witnesses. In Jude, verses 6 and 7, is the following. Jude says, The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude is making another point, but he makes reference to not only Sodom and Gomorrah, but these angels which went after strange flesh in, uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 6. In 2 Peter, a similar remark is made. Peter says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to Tartarus. He uses a strange word. It's translated hell in your Bible, but it's a strange word. It's the only place that this word occurs in the Bible. Cast them down to Tartarus, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah. And he goes on. He adds an interesting thing. He ties this strange going on to the days of Noah. But this word Tartarus probably deserves a little comment because it's, uh, it's unique here. It's not unique in Greek. It's used in other literature, but it's the only place in the Bible it occurs. Tartarus was to the Greeks. It's a term for the dark abode of woe. It's the pit of darkness of the unseen world. In Homer's Iliad, it's described as being as far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. So I still don't know where it is, but I don't want to go there. Now this whole idea of angels, fallen angels, coming down and mixing with human women to create a hybrid 
is a strange concept, but we're startled to discover that legend. It gives rise to legends in every ancient culture. The Greek titans are probably familiar to most of us from the, in the Western world. The titans were part of the Greek mythology, partly terrestrial, partly celestial. They rebelled against their father Uranus, and after a prolonged contest were defeated by Zeus and then condemned into Tartarus. That's all part of the Greek mythology, but apparently embodies a memory of some serious things that did happen in, those, uh, in, the, uh, in the prehistory. These legends we'll find in Sumer, Assyria, in Egypt, the Incas, Mayan, the Epic of Gilgamesh. You'll find these uh, equivalent legends in Persia, obviously in Greece, in India, Bolivia, South Sea Islands, even the Sioux Indians. It's interesting, I'm told by the anthropologists, that uh, the American Indians, when they met a stranger, they would hold up a hand. This business of how is Hollywood stuff. But holding up a hand, they, if you had a stranger, you wanted to count his fingers, because they had a terror of the six-fingered men. And they have legends in the, uh, of all kinds among the uh, American Indians of these giants that populated the earth, came down from, they call them, some call them the star people. They were very, very large, very powerful. And there's, you even find allusions to these in Buffalo Bill's uh, uh, autobiography and uh, so on. So in the classic art, we have, At we have uh, Hercules, who was, a, who was a Nephilim in Hebrew, and Atlas. These, were, these, uh, these legends uh, derive from these hybrids. Now, there is an alternative view. This is, uh, there are many people uh, that are graduates from seminaries that have never been exposed to the angel view that I'm sharing with you. They've been taught, many people have been taught, that the sons of God term really ref refers to the line of Seth. Uh, Seth, these were presumably the good guys. And uh, it, the, the sons of God is a term they try to ascribe to the Sethite leadership. And the daughters of Adam, they say, well, it really wasn't the daughters of Adam, it was the daughters of just Cain. And uh, I don't know what's wrong with the daughters of the others, but anyway. Um, and the sin that, that's involved there is the failure to maintain separation. They try to make the face that the line of Seth should be separate, and they commingled with Cain, the daughters of Cain. They should have done that. Uh, so the failure to separation, they assume, is the, the sin involved. And they don't explain why the offspring of these two families would be supernaturally weird, uh, uh, the Nephilim, which were the, uh, dis obviously distinctive. This view, the so-called line of Seth view, emerged in the fifth century. Celsus and Julian the Apostate used the traditional belief of these fallen angels and so forth to attack Christianity, and Julius Africanus resorted to the Sethite theory as a more comfortable way of defending the scripture. And uh, that was fine, except, and Cyril of Alexander used it to repudiate the orthodox position. They said the orthodox position was quaint, but not true. And Augustine embraced the Sethite th theory, and by his doing so, it became the primary doctrine of the medieval church and has endured uh, through uh, the derivative denominations from the Reformation and the rest of it. So it prevails right into the Middle Ages. However, the text itself Said the sons of God is never used of believers in the Old Testament. Seth was not God. Cain was not Adam. These are all contrivances. And there's no mentions of the daughters of uh, Elohim. It, it's unbalanced. And there's also some grammatical antithesis that is ignored, and I won't get into that here. The lines were separated later. It isn't until Genesis 11 that we have the separation imposed. And that was only on Isaac, uh, Ishmael not so. And furthermore, Genesis 6 says all flesh was corrupted. There were no good guys, if you will. And uh, Noah found grace, and that's a whole other issue. But only Enoch and Noah's eight are spared. Now, th think about this. God chose to wipe out the entire world except for nine people. He removes Enoch first, and then these eight on the barge or boat that we'll get to are spared. And, uh, and also these Barha Elohim took wives. It doesn't sound like they had any choice in the matter. They chose who they wanted to. If the Sethites were the good guys, why did they uh, perish in the flood? And furthermore, Enosh, who is Seth's son, is the guy that initiated defiance of God, if you study the, uh, the text carefully. See, in Genesis 4, verse 26, in the previous chapter, um, we discover if it's there's a mistranslation. Men began to call upon the name of the Lord. It says, no, men began to profane the name of the Lord. And that's in the tar Targum of Ankylos, the Targum of Jonathan, the... Uh, Hebrew translations that are the most venerated translations among the rabbis make it quite clear that Enosh was, was bad news. 
So the the line the Seth were the line of Seth was not uh, the good guys and Cain the bad guys. Quite the contrary. Cain murdered his brother, and he yes he did sin. But you'll also notice if you look at his genealogy, his children for several generations carried the name of God in them. I believe they were believers. I believe they were repentant believers. So, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, in the in the rabbinical literature, this this is, is the one that supports this angel view of Genesis six. The whole idea of the Nephilim being unnatural is important. Uh, the, uh, they had supernatural offspring, the so-called Hagibarim, the mighty men. And there's also this, there were no women of renown. What's going on here? And what made Noah's genealogy so distinctive? See, it's a gene pool problem that underlies the flood of Noah. Now, this angel view, of course, is a traditional rabbinical view. The Book of Enoch supports it. Not that it's, a ther- not that it's inspired, but I'm speaking of vocabulary and grammar. As, as well as other literature, the testimony of twelve patriarchs, uh, jo, uh, Josephus presents this. The Septuagint, the early church fathers taught this. Philo of Alexandria, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, and the rest of them. Uh, modern scholarship: G. H. Pember, Dehan, Mackintosh, Dillich, Gablin, Arthur W. Pink, Donald Gray Barnhouse, Henry Morris, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, Hal Lindsey, Chuck Smith. And modern scholarship also. Uh, embraces this. The Sethite view that most people have been taught, even in seminaries, is unscriptural. The text itself refutes it. The inferred separation is nonsense. The inferred godliness of Sethites is, is not true. The inferred Canaanite uh, subset, uh, Adamites, uh, the unnatural offspring, the New Testament confirmations. But perhaps the most important thing, and that's one reason I'm spending this time on it, you will not understand much of what happened in the Old Testament and you won't understand some of the prophetic issues unless you understand this view. I used to think, well, it's just a view, and it's a, it, it, there's two different views, and that's fine. Let's go on, until I realized that this undergirds a great deal of of, uh, of understanding or misunderstanding of the Old Testament, if you, whether or not you understand the, the angel view. You see, there were Nephilim after the flood, also, and uh, Genesis six four said there were in those days and also after that, and. Uh, You'll discover when Joshua goes into the land, when he finally gets in the land, there are at least four tribes, tribal names, that he's, he's instructed by God to wipe out every man, woman, and child of these tribes. The Rephaim, the Emim, the Horim, the Zamzumim. These were vestiges of the Nephilim. Uh, Arba, Anak, and his sons, the Anakim, when they encountered Canaan. It's in Numbers 13, 33. When Moses sends the uh, Twelve spies into the land to spy out the land. They, ten of them come back and say, "We're grasshoppers in their sight. They're terrified." Uh, two of them, Joshua and Caleb, said, "No, let's God, Lord's on our side. Go." And they, uh, because they trembled, didn't go. They wandered for virtually forty years in the wilderness. What did they encounter? They encountered Nephilim. Numbers thirteen thirty-three. There were Nephilim in the land. So it's important to understand this. Og, the king of Bashan, was the king of the giants. There were Nephilim up in the Galan Heights. That's in Deuteronomy three and Joshua twelve and so on. Goliath and his four brothers were Anakim, sons of Anak, and, and so forth. See, these are stratagems of Satan. He was attempting to corrupt Adam's line. When we get to Genesis 12 and God calls Abraham and announces that his plan of redemption for man isn't just, that his redemption doesn't just involve man, it's going to involve specifically Abraham and his descendants. Satan could then focus his attack on Abraham. The famine, the destruction of the male line in the Exodus. Pharaoh's pers- even after he released them, per- uh, Pharaoh pursues them to wipe them out. Satan is trying to wipe out the Jews because he's trying to wipe out God's um, program of redemption. When they finally return to, um, well, when God announces to Abraham that his descendants 400 years later are going to return to Canaan, that gave Satan four centuries to lay down a minefield. And he populated Canaan with these strange creatures. When God reveals that his plan is going to involve David, that allows Satan to focus his attack against David's line. And as you go right through the whole chronicle, from Second Chronicles, uh, Isaiah, uh, so on, you'll discover again and again there's attempts to wipe out the royal line, but there's always somebody that gets saved, a servant that, that saves a child and so forth to maintain that line. And uh, uh, even when you get to the book of Esther in the Persian Empire, Haman tries to wipe out the Jews. Again, it's a satanic plot very analogous to what Hitler tried to do in more recent times. When you get to the New Testament, it continues. Joseph's fear when Mary's pregnant. That was a capital situation there. Herod's attempts to wipe out all the babies in Bethlehem. 
when they try to throw Jesus off the cliff in Nazareth. There were two storms at sea, and I personally suspect that those storms were not normal storms, they were you know, uh, exceptional storms. The, the disciples aboard were professional seamen that knew those waters, and they were terrified. Something strange going on there. And of course, the ultimate thing is the cross, and it's still not through. One reason you need to understand this, because Satan is still at it in a variety of different ways. You need to understand that. Let's talk a little bit about angels, because I think they're often widely misunderstood. Angels always seem to appear in human form. At Sodom and Gomorrah, they were there. The homosexuals wanted to attack them. It tells you something about angels. They're always in pairs at the resurrection, at the ascension, and other places. Angels spoke to men. They took people by the hand. They ate meals with them. The New Testament tells us that many of us have entertained angels unawares. So they apparently can take uh, human form. They are capable of direct physical combat. The Passover in Egypt was the result of the death angel in Egypt. The s- one angel, after dinner one night, slaughters 185,000 Syrians. And uh, so... Uh, this is, this is uh, we'll, we'll get into some of this as we get into uh, the, the, those descriptions. But the point is, angels are capable of materializing and engaging in physical combat. We do know that angels in heaven don't marry. Because uh, uh, marriage, uh, procreation is for mortal, be- is a way of multiplying mortal people. These are not, the, the, they're, not designed, they're not intended to be uh, reproducing. Because they don't marry in heaven, many people assume they can't have sex. Let's be careful here. I think the scripture makes no restriction on angels, the technology available to them, especially if they're bent on mischief. And that's what we're dealing with here. Angels are formidable. Demons in the New Testament are very different creatures. They always seek embodiment. Angels are materialized. Demons can't. Demons appear to be powerless except to the extent that they can indwell a host of some kind. And they have to do that with permission, apparently. So we'll, you want it when you study your Bible, try to summarize what you think you'll learn about angels and summarize what you learn about demons. And I think you'll find they're distinctively different. See, in, in Matthew 22 and also Mark 12, he says, speaking of believers that are in the resurrection body, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And that simply means that uh, uh, sex and procreation is not part of the program there. That doesn't make any comment of what angels that are up to mischief might do. And this word habitation is a fascinating word. The word in the Greek is okaterion. It only appears twice in the Bible. It refers to the body as a dwelling place for the spirit, but it's used two places. In Jude 6, it's that which the angels had disrobed from. In 2 Corinthians 5.2, it's alluding to the heavenly body that we aspire to as believers. And... Uh, In Jude 6, the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. There's that word, okaterian. In uh, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, it says, We know that if our heavenly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, or our habit, or habitation, or our okaterian, which is from heaven. So it's interesting. Same, ter- same term. I think this is a highly technical term used in a very specific way. Well, as all sea has its roots in Genesis 3 when God declares war on Satan. He says, I'll put enmity between thee, that's the nachash, the shining one, and the woman between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And uh, so we have a conflict between two seeds. The seed of the woman from that passage becomes a title of Jesus Christ. It becomes a messianic label. The seed of the woman, which incidentally is a contradiction in terms because the seed is the man, not the woman. It's a contradiction in biology, not just grammar. But of course, it's it's an illusion that Isaiah uh, Isaiah 7.14 picks up as an indication of a virgin birth. We'll talk more about that when we get there. But it also alludes to the seed of the serpent. There's another seed, the serpent being the red dragon. These are allusions to the coming world leader who is assisted by a false prophet. And this duo is going to wreak havoc, and we'll deal with that when we get there too. But these forces are behind the world today. We need to recognize that. They have an agenda. That agenda is to entrap you into and bring you to oblivion. The flood of Noah. 
Now we get to the famous story of Noah, Noah's Ark. It's amazing how many people say, well, the, you know, the skeptics say the ark was not big enough to hold all the species. Couldn't be. Well, how big was the ark? They don't know. They don't know. Uh, how many species were there? Well, they're not sure. Well, let's take a look at this. The ark was 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. It's specified. There's some scholastic debate just exactly what a cubit is. Anywhere uh, uh, from 18 to 22 inches is the typical estimate. For our purposes, we'll just assume it's 18 inches, foot and a half. That would make this uh, arc 450 feet long, 50 and 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. It would have a displacement then of approximately 24,000 tons, 1.4 million cubic feet, the equivalent roughly of 522 railroad cars. That's a non-trivial volumetric space. That would be room enough for 125,000 sheep. Now, taking a sheep as a nominal average, obviously many animals are smaller, more smaller than larger, and there are, of course, obviously some large exceptions. But in any case, how many species? A defendable estimate is about 18,000 on the high side. So you've got 125,000 sheep, you've got room for 18,000 species. That leaves you room for some, a few large ones. And uh, now there's a couple of other, we don't know, we do know that whatever entered the ark a year later left. They lost none, gained none. Losing none, okay, fine, they were preserved, none died, that's surprising. But secondly, the fact there was no, bulb, there was no bulbification, no additions, indicates that God somehow, we, we, most scholars presume, we does not say this, but presume that some kind of hibernation may have been uh, established, because God is in this thing, obviously. This is all based on the cubit of 18 inches, the most common estimate you see in most of the textbooks. But there are cubits that virtually approach 25 inches. If it was a 25 inch cubit, just to give you some feeling here, that would be 625 feet long, 100 feet wide, and 63 feet deep. And uh, its displacement then would be 65,000 tons, 4.1 million cubic feet, 1,400 railroad cars, and, and of course that gets to be you know, a third of a million sheep and so forth, and you still only have 18,000 species. So the point is, this estimate is not only very large in the original, but even it's also vulnerable to being much larger by depending on what the cubit really was. And as a Naval Academy graduate, I have to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the uh, marine architecture here. The ark, as I say, was, uh, uh, you know, uh, 50 feet, in, using a foot and a half cubit, about 50 feet wide and 30 feet high. That turns out to be mathematically a very useful ratio because you have a center of gravity in a, in a device like this and you have a center of buoyancy uh, depending on the water that it displaces. And uh, if it tilts over, gravity is pulling down from the center of gravity, the center of buoyancy is pushing up from the center of buoyancy, and you'll notice there'll be a tendency to, mo to, to, write, to, to uh, uh, write this up. It turns out with these particular ratios, it can sustain an enormous tipping and still be uh, stable. This has, th these ratios have a, a very, very attractive stability, uh, uh, hydrologically, if you will. And so I, it's inter this is, this is, is not some primitive contrivance here. It's, it's, there's some very subtle engineering behind this. Well, the flood, it rained for 40 days, but there's, that's not, that does not account for all the water. See, it wasn't just rain. The fountains of the deep were opened up, uh, there's a, uh, and, and uh, these waters prevailed for 150 days. It rained only for 40 days. The waters prevailed for 150 days. They're in the ark, five months floating, seven months waiting on this mountain. Now, it's interesting, again, if you go through the ancient traditions, you discover there are traditions of a flood, a global flood, disastrous flood, in virtually all the ancient traditions. Many of them are quite fanciful. Many of them, most of them in fact, contain elements that are consistent with the biblical account. The Egyptian, Babylonian, Persian, Greek, Hindu, Chinese, the Druids, the Polynesians, Mexicans, Peruvians, American Indians again, and in Greenland, they all have very colorful, very interesting flood traditions. Now the question is, was it universal or local? There are some people that try to indicate, well, this was just a local flood. If it's just a local flood, God did not keep His promises. See, every living thing was destroyed, the Scripture says. All high mountains were under the, under the entire heavens were covered. You say, gee, there's some mountains that are a lot higher. Yes, they may have been disrupted since. That's a whole other issue. And uh, 
The ark rested on the mountains of Ararat. But God then promises Noah that he'll never do that again. Now, if that was, if that was a local flood, there have been lots of local floods, which means God didn't keep his promise. If that was a universal global flood, that God said, I'll never do that again. Peter warns us to watch the small print, because the next time he'll do it, he'll do it with fire, not water. That's his point. Now, some questions here. We know that uh, dinosaurs, apparently, were quickly drowned and buried. Is that possible? We believe there's some dinosaurs on, on well, there were some on the uh, ark, probably babies, I assume, because we find dinosaurs talked about in the book of Job. And uh, we find that mammoths were quickly drowned in North America and quick frozen in Siberia. These are mysteries. That uh, the ones in Siberia, where they're frozen, they still have food in their digestive tract. They can analyze their diets. But the main thing is they, were, they died suddenly, very quickly. And uh, the, the petrified forests are found 100 miles from the South Pole by Admiral Byrd. Petrified forests in the South Pole, really. See, it was a universal climate at one time. Land animals found fossilized in locations below sea level. Now, the very fact you have fossils, we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, but that you know, fossils imply um, uh, uh, pressure, and, and uh, uh, the absence of decay is also an indication of shortness of time. Sea animals are found fossilized at high elevations. You can go to very high mountains and find uh, seashells and so on. One key thing about fossils you need to understand, fossils are dead. And uh, that may sound silly to say, but realize that that means they were after Adam, after Adam. And uh, there's no decay, which implies a sudden, quick change. And the dating depends on circular reasoning. You say, Gee, we found a 10 million year old fossil here. Really? How do you know it's 10 million year old? Well, it's because it's in the layer that represents 10 million years. Oh, really? How do you know that layer was 10 million years? Well, because there's 10 million old fossils there. You see the circular reason? You think I'm being facetious. Watch the reasoning in your textbooks. You'll discover that they date the fossils by the layer, and they date the layer by the fossils. It's all circular reasoning, very, uh, and based on all kinds of attackable pro uh, premises. And why are there no fossils formed today? When something dies, it goes down and decays. There is a theory about the flood that has to do with the canopy. And that fact that there was, uh, the theory is that there was an uh, atmospheric water shield that protected the Earth from cosmic radiation. And this may attribute, this may be one of the explanations to the long lifetimes. Before the flood, we have these extended lifetimes prior to the flood. And uh, the water falls, it complements the subterranean waters that are unleashed in uh, chapter 7. And also we understand from chapter 10 of Genesis, this continental drift occurred from the fractured land masses. Now if you're interested in this area, I encourage you to look at the books by the Institute of Creation Research, particularly Henry Morris and John Ritkin's book called The Genesis Record. And they get into this, and you get into the whole canopy theory, and it has its proponents. There are many scientists who believe this is correct. There are other scientists that have a slightly different view. There are a lot of geological mysteries, however. The Grand Canyon origin is something worth studying. That alone will certify all of this if you want to get into it. The fact there's a mid-oceanic mountain ranges have to deal with this. The submarine sub, uh, canyons involved in the, on the Earth. Magnetic variations on the ocean floor coal and oil formations, frozen mammoths, all of these are areas of study that you'll discover all argue for support of a recent global flood. Metamor there are certain uh, rock uh, changes that are worth studying and the fossil gradient. All these are geological mysteries that are explained by a universal flood. And the jigsaw fit of the continents. One, one of the, there's another, it, it, contrast to the, the canopy theory, there's another view called the hydroplates. Probably both of these are true to some extent. Hydroplate theory points out that the continents were inter are and were in interconnected. There's subterranean water underneath them. With increasing pressures, there's buckling that takes place. It's horizontal buckling that explains most of this. And if you're interested in this area, I encourage you to investigate the ministry of Walt Brown in the Center for Scientific Creation in Phoenix, Arizona. It's got marvelous materials on this and the whole creation area, basically pointing out that the Earth is uh, had a, uh, a cracking and a breaking, and these things all fit. There is a there is a, a great deal of of, uh, of uh, technical background in their materials you can get into. But let's get back to the flood. It rained for 40 days, and again, not just rain. There were fountains of the deep. The waters prevailed for 150 days. The ark, they're in the ark for 377 days. Five months floating, seven and a half months on the mountain. Now, some perspectives of all this. There's only one ark. 
There's only one way to be saved in that old world. There was only one door in the ark. And when that door was closed, it was closed. And one of the interesting questions, you know, who closed the door? God closed the door. And I'll leave it to you to think about this. Could Noah have gotten out if he wanted to? I personally don't think so. There's no births or deaths. Everybody on the ark was preserved. Now, all your theological speculations certainly would end when that door was shut. And the people outside could argue all they like. They were not saved. There are only three groups of people that are dealt with in the flood of Noah. Those that perished in the flood, of course. Most of them, all but nine people. There were those that were preserved through the flood, the eight that were in the ark. And there were those that were removed prior to the flood. And uh, I suspect that there are some lessons here in terms of how God deals with things. And I think there'll be all three groups of people that are going to be dealt with prophetically as we get into the prophetic word. There'll be those that removed prior. There are those that will be preserved through the judgments that are coming. And as I said, there's other flood traditions all through the ancient uh, groups, Egyptian, Babylonian, Persian, Greek, so forth. Um, now, you can get through it carefully. You'll, you'll find some people quibble about the record. If you read the record carefully, you'll find it all fits. And I'm, that's, a, that's not only true here, it's true in general. Many places you'll find some critics say, well, here it says this and here it says that, and they don't really seem to agree. Whenever you find that, rejoice, because behind that will be a discovery. The Lord always rewards the diligent. But getting to this, that we have Noah enter the ark at uh, the tenth day of the second month. Seven days later, the rain begins. And uh, then we have 40 days later, the heavy rains uh, stop. Um, and uh, 110 days later, the waters recede, and the ark's now on Mount Ararat. 74 day, days later, the mountaintops are starting to become visible. 40 days later, the raven is sent, which can survive on its own. Then the dove is sent, not dove number one is sent and returns, dove number two is sent and returns to the leaf, and then dove number three is sent and does not return, which tells them that it's safe now to leave the ark. And so 22 days later, the water recedes, and Noah saw a dry land, and uh, when the land completely dry, they exit the ark. That's in the, uh, so that's, a, that's, the, that's the chronology. You can study it more carefully if you want to get into the details. But basically, it's seven days till the, the uh, from the seven days, there's 150 days it rests on Mount Ararat. 163 days they saw dry land. Anyway, it's a total of 377 days for you want to get into that. But there's another interesting thing. The, this is something we're going to talk a lot about as we go. The ark rested on the seventh month, on the, on the 17th day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. And I want you to notice the word mountains there is plural. That turns out to be important because there's many people, there's much tradition that's, that has ignored that. Why did the Holy Spirit want you to know this very day? See, if you... If you're a well-adjusted person, you're reading your Bible, it says the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month on the mountains of Ararat. Uh, you say, fine, and you, you read on. But if you've been to one of my Bible studies, you are no longer a normal well-adjusted reader because uh, you'll remember that I said everything in here is by design. Everything in here is deliberate. Everything here is a result of the Holy Spirit. Why did the Holy Spirit want you to know that the ark rested in the seventh month of the 17th day of the month on the mountains of Ararat? Well, <coughs> You need to understand, first of all, there are two calendars in the Jewish community. The civil calendar is the Genesis calendar. The year starts in the first of Tishri, which is in the fall. It's called Rosh Hashanah, the head of the, head of the year, the new year. The Jewish new year is in the fall. But they have a religious calendar where it starts in Nisan, which is in the spring. Because in Exodus, when God sets up the Passover, He tells Moses, among other things, this month, the month of Nisan, will, shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So because of that, the religious year starts in the spring, in the, the month in which Passover falls, the month of Nisan. So the, the old calendar, Tishri is the first month, Nisan is the seventh. But from the Exodus on, the religious calendar starts at Nisan, it's the first month, and it turns out that Tishri becomes the seventh month. Okay. Jesus Christ was crucified on the on Passover, the 14th of Nisan. How long was he in the grave? Three days. The resurrection then took place on the 17th of Nisan, the seventh month, on the Genesis calendar. See, God's new beginning on the planet Earth was on the anniversary, in anticipation, of our new beginning in Jesus Christ. And I think that's very deliberate. I think it evidences that God enjoys dealing in precise patterns. 
I never use the word approximate and God in the same sentence. But it fascinates me to see a pattern set down in Genesis fulfilled in the Gospels. So be sensitive of that because there's many of these throughout the Scripture. The ark rested in the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the month on the mountains of Ararat. So new, Noah's new beginning on the planet Earth on the anniversary anticipation of our new beginning in Christ. Okay. Now Ararat in Turkey, which many people think is the Mount Ararat, is a single mountain. There are not a lot of mountains around it, which makes it suspect. But uh, let's move on here. The, uh, in, in Genesis chapter 11 we're going to discover the whole earth was of one language and one speech. You know, basically Paleo-Hebrew, the ancient Hebrew. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. That's the first couple of verses of Genesis chapter 11. Well, if you take a look at a map, I've marked on the map in the left there, there's a place called Mount Ararat in Turkey, a traditional Mount Ararat. And you have Babel, or what later becomes Babylon, south of it. I might point out to you that Mount Ararat is not only north of Babel, slightly west. Mount Ararat in Turkey is a site that was labeled by Marco Polo in the 14th or 15th century. It's a traditional site. And there are many people that claim to have seen the ark up there, that have found you know, pieces of wood and that sort of thing. And uh, so far the people I know that have tried to check that out get quite frustrated because it's all legend, all myth. It uh, uh, defies confirmation. But let's stay with the Scripture. Genesis 11, 2 says they came from the east to Shinar, which means if I was looking for the Noah's Ark, I would look east of Babel. That's where they came from. And east of here, there's a whole range of extremely high mountains. And I anticipate, I won't get into conjectures here other than to say I anticipate that it's going to be found, and I think when it is found, it's going to be found in Iran, in the high mountains of Iran. But let's get back to Genesis 9. We've got a new beginning now. They're out of the ark. There's a whole new order. They're not vegetarians anymore. God instructs them to use to, to, to uh, uh, eat animals and so forth. Capital punishment is ordained, and the human government is established. There's a whole, you can study that quite carefully in 9. Sinful man has been wiped out by the flood, but not sin. Man is still sinful, and uh, Noah is no exception. He has a vineyard, and gets, there's a, some things that happen. But but there's a prophecy. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. So Ham, Shem, and Japheth, there's prophecies here we'll pick up when we get into chapter 11. Something else, back when we were talking about the creation, we talked about an entropy profile of the universe, how order was inserted in the universe in, in the six successive steps, and then rest. We recognize that the fall of man and God's curse, that the, the uh, order was disrupted, that entropy was increased. Encre entropy increases in the, as you go down on this chart. So the fall of man resu results in a decay, a, dest a destruction of the universe. The flood also, the flood was more than just a lot of water. We know a great deal uh, that we, uh, that, uh, of, of changes. We don't know anything about the creation prior to the f fall, and we only have some conjectures about the creation prior to the flood. And the history as we know it really is certainly since the fall of man, but probably a history as we know it in other terms since the flood. The post-flood changes. We know that the thermal blanket that once protected the earth is gone because the universal climate is no longer there. It's the end of a universal climate. We find these tropical creatures embedded in the ice and the, near the poles and we realize that the earth had a, a very different e ecological situation in those days. Atmospheric pressure apparently is reduced 50% because we know that pterodactyls couldn't fly unless they, we had at least two atmospheres of, of uh, atmospheric pressure. And we also notice that these extended longevities that are recorded start to decline. So from going from the hundreds of years down, ultimately, down to the three score and ten or the 70 years that even to this day with all our improvements in medicine still hover around. Well, let's move on to chapter 10. Chapter 10 is a discussion of the genealogy of the sons of Noah. It's called the Table of Nations. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Japheth had sons, and it goes through all of these, Gomer, Magog, Medai, Yavan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras. And as you study your Bible, you may want to make note of these and, and uh, try to learn, especially uh, the important ones. Uh, Magog 
is very, very important to understand when you get to Ezekiel, because Magog is uh, the forebear of the Scythians, which in turn are the forebear of the true Russians. And they're very prominent in the prophecy in Ezekiel, and you want to watch that. Mad-Eye, uh, 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 from them came the Medes, which of course we call today the Kurds, and uh, they're going to be prominent in, in our uh, current news broadcast too. As well, Tubal and Meshach were principal uh, uh, ingredients to the area that we know as a Turkey, so that's it. Now, Ham, is the other, he has Cush, Mithram, Put, and Canaan. Um, when you think of Cush, um, he settled south of the second cataract of the Nile. It tends to be idiomatic of black Africa. Mitzrayim is a different guy, and that's Egypt. Mitzrayim is the biblical term for ancient Egypt. And uh, Put is North Africa, which is quite distinct from Cush. The North Africans are yet another. So you've got Cush, Mitzrayim, and Pete, all Hamites, but of different backgrounds, and of course Canaan. And it's interesting that all Israel has to do to uh, find out who the enemies are is to take a look at the genealogies. They would be their enemies. So uh, the, uh, the Cushites, that is the descendants of Cush, uh, settled in South uh, Arabia. And, uh, and southern Egypt, Sudan, and uh, northern Eth Ethiopia. And they became mingled with some of the Semitic tribes there and so forth. Um, the first Hamite that's really significant not in this, is, uh, is, of course, the Canaanite group. The third son, son, of course, is Shem, with the Elam, Asher, Arfaxad, Lud, and Aram. And Shem are the ones that we're interested in because out of that will come a very prominent one. He has Elam, which is Persia. It's interesting when Isaiah is called upon to uh, talk about the Persian Empire a hundred years before it emerges. How does he deal with it? He calls it, he speaks of it in terms of the forebear, the Elam. Elam is what the uh, Bible would call, what we think of as Persia, which is modern Iran. And we have others here. Afaxet is very important under him as Selah, which in turn has Eber, from which the word Hebrew comes. And then we have Peleg, during which the, the earth is divided. And uh, Joktan, and we have some others, but it's from a Peleg that we have ultimately uh, Terah, whose whose son is Abraham, and our whole study of the second unit of Genesis, the second half of Genesis, from chapter 12 to the end, is our study of Abraham. Very very important, one of the most important people uh, in in history for a lot of reasons. Kind of interesting. There are about 26 mentioned in under uh, the under Shem. 30 under Ham, and 70 under Japheth. There are 70 nations listed in Genesis 10, the table of nations. That's interesting because they're going to put in parallel to the 70 of the family of Joseph, that, or family of Jacob, I should say, that goes to, uh, down to Egypt when we number them. And so we have 70 nations from Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. We'll have 70 families that will enter Egypt. And that's interesting that God indicates in Deuteronomy 32 that the bounds of both are set. That the boundaries of these nations are determined by what God wants to have happen. And uh, so uh, there, there are there are some discrepancies here. In Genesis 10 we have 70 in the table of nations. And uh, they're mentioned in 66 and 46 and 46. Uh, we, have, we have a total of uh, 70 that go to Egypt, but it, in one place there's only 66 because there are already four down there. And uh, there are, so you have the 66 plus the four still gets you 70. In Acts 7.14, Stephen mentions 75 because he's including Joseph's grandsons, uh, which the Septuagint makes clear. But uh, so these discrepancies get resolved. But the main, main issue is to recognize that the scripture clearly seems to set a parallelism between the 70 in the table of nations and the 70 that become the nation of Israel itself, for what it's worth. Okay. There is a person that emerges that out of Ham that is very important to be aware of. That's a guy by the name of Nimrod, the first world dictator. His name means we rebel. He's the first world dictator. He founds two cities, Babylon and Nineveh, both of which become world capitals in their history. Babylon will be the capital, I believe, of his successor in a sense. Uh, there will be a world dictator that emerges out of Assyria that we call the Antichrist. And I believe Babylon will be his capital, among others. But anyway, let's get back, take a look at uh, chapter 11. There's one language, the book, language of Hebrew. There is a godless confederacy organized by this first world dictator on the plain of Shinar. You need to be familiar with that term. The word Shinar occurs seven times in the Old Testament. Always it alludes to the plain in which Babel, the Tower of Heaven, was built. And Babel was originally some kind of astrological uh, temple 
Um, it's at this place that the zodiac, as we know it, or the Matsaroth in the Hebrew, was corrupted. It, strangely enough, seems to embody a, a record of God's plan of redemption for mankind, if you understand the names of the stars and the order of brightness of the 12 constellations that link to the 12 tribes. But uh, all that gets corrupted at this time, so most of what we know in the field of astronomy carries labels from the original Bab Babylonian ter uh, terms. Don't confuse this with astrology, which is an occultic application of those things. Uh, these labels are still used by astronomers today, as, in, like in, in a sense, a form of geography. You should also understand that your whole Bible can be viewed as a tale of two cities. The city of Babylon, which is regarded the city of man, or the city of Satan, if you will. And the city of Jerusalem, with all its faults, is still considered the city of God. In fact, gets replaced by the new Jerusalem. Babylon and Jerusalem, from the beginning, climax at the end, where Babylon is destroyed in Revelation, and the new Jerusalem replaces the the one destroyed. So, so we have the Tower of Babel, very, very prominent in ancient history, going to be prominent again in prophecy. And we'll deal with that when we get to the book of Revelation. And, uh, and, and also Isaiah and Jeremiah will deal with it. Okay, so we've, we have now moved to um, the next unit. We finished our survey of the first unit of Genesis, chapters 1 through 11. In the next session, we'll be picking up chapter 12 to the end of the chapter, the time of the patriarchs. We'll talk about Abraham from chapters 12 to 20, Isaac from 21 to 26, Jacob from 27 to 36, and then the rest of it, the, book of the incredible, colorful story of Joseph. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, commonly called the patriarchs, and we'll take that up in the next hour.